You guys want me to read you a Christmas story? Yeah, sure. Okay. The night before Christmas. Twas the night before Christmas when all through the house not a creature was stirring, not even a mouse. The stockings were hung by the chimney with care in hopes that St. Nicholas soon would be there. The children were nestled all snug in their beds while visions of sugar plums danced in their heads. And Mama in her kerchief and I in my cap had just settled down for a long winter's nap. When out on the lawn there rose such a clatter, I sprang from my bed to see what was the matter. Away to the window I flew like a flash, tore open the shutters and threw up the sash. The moon on the breast of the newly fallen snow gave a luster of midday to objects below. When what to my wondering eyes should appear but a miniature sleigh and eight tiny reindeer. With a little old driver so lively and quick, I knew in a moment it must be St. Nick. More rapid than eagles, his coursers they came, and he whistled and shouted and called them by name. Now Dasher, now Dancer, now Prancer and Vixen, on Comet, on Cupid, on Donder and Blitzen. To the top of the porch, to the top of the wall, now dash away, dash away, dash away all. As dry leaves before the wild hurricane fly, when they meet with an obstacle, mount to the sky. So up to the housetop the coursers they flew, with sleigh full of toys and St. Nicholas too. And then in a twinkling I heard on the roof the prancing and pawing of each little hoof. As I drew in my head and was turning around, down the, chim- down the chimney St. Nicholas came with a bound. He was dressed in all fur from his head to his foot, and his clothes were, like, were all tarnished with ashes and soot. A bundle of toys he had flung on his back, and he looked like a peddler just opening his pack. His eyes how they twinkled, his dimples how merry, his cheeks were like roses, his nose like a cherry. His droll little mouth was drawn up like a bow, and the beard on his chin was as white as the snow. The stump of a pipe he held tight in his teeth, and the smoke had encircled his head like a wreath. He had a broad face and a little round belly that shook when he laughed like a bowl full of jelly. He was chubby and plump, a right jolly old elf, and I laughed when I saw him in spite of myself. A wink of his eye and a twist of his head soon gave me to know I had nothing to dread. He spoke not a word but went straight to his work and filled the, all the stockings, then turned with a jerk. And laying his finger aside of his nose and giving a nod up the chimney, he rose. He sprang to his sleigh, to his team gave a whistle, and away they all flew like the down of a thistle. But I heard him exclaim as he drove out of sight, Merry Christmas to all, and to all a good night. The end. Boys and girls, isn't that a beautiful story? Would you like for me to read to you another great story from the Bible? Sure. Okay. This is how the birth of Jesus Christ came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be with child through the Holy Spirit. In the sixth month, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you're highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will be with child and give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will never end. How would this be? Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin. The angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age. And she who was said to be barren is in her sixth month. For nothing is the impossible with God. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May it be as you have said. The angel left her. 2020 
for many of us is a year that we want to forget about as soon as we possibly can. It's been a year filled with chaos and uncertainty. And it's not the first time in our history that there's been chaos and uncertainty at a worldwide level. You know, and usually that, that kind of stuff happens at a more of a regional level. You know, when there's a hurricane or a tornadoes or uh, floods or droughts, those kind of things. But on any routine day, chaos and uncertainty can strike our individual lives. My prayer for us is that, that we just slow down long enough to be able to find the hope in Christmas this year. How many of you uh, love Christmas music, Christmas carols, right? Raise your hands. At the campuses, do the same thing, right? Raise your hands. Um, my wife loves all things Christmas. I mean, she loves Christmas. And uh, uh, it, it, so it's the first cold day we get, she's going to pull Christmas music out. And that could be in October, right? Um, I'm, uh, Christmas carols are, aren't that big a deal to me. I'm not really that much into Christmas carols. But sometimes it's nice just to slow down to listen. Cattle are lowing. I think that means mooing. And no crying he makes? Like, come on, right? You, you know Jesus cried, right? Yeah, he cried. He, he's a baby. Babies cry. He, he, also, he also pooped his diaper, right? That's what babies do. Christmas carols are not the place to get your theology from, that's for sure. Silent night. That's always, a, that's always a favorite. A little history on Silent Night. Uh, back during World War I, um, the Germans and British were fighting each other. And uh, it was, the year was 1914. And on Christmas Eve, uh, on one side of no man's land, the Germans began to sing 
silent night. And then on the other side, the British heard them and recognized the song and began to sing it back to them. And you had both sides singing Silent Night. And that ushered in an impromptu ceasefire where British soldiers and German soldiers came out of their foxholes, met each other in no man's land, and celebrated Christmas with each other on New Year's Eve and Christmas Day, or excuse me, Christmas Day, uh, Eve and Christmas Day of 1914. You can look it up. It's called the Christmas Truce 1914. Look it up. But it's also an example of those uh, songs that I don't know they really represent the original Christmas very well. It's like, I mean, it's pretty, right? It's, it's so peaceful and tranquil. But I think the days leading up to and the days following may not have been so peaceful and tranquil but it really is a, a pretty song Silent night, holy night. All is calm, all is bright. On virgin mother and child. Holy infant so tender and mild. Sleep in I, it is a beautiful song, but I, I think if we just think through the kind of the circumstances leading up to the original Christmas and kind of following the original Christmas, you'll see that it really wasn't that peaceful or tranquil or maybe not even that silent, right? Let's just kind of go through the main characters with me. Think with me. Uh, so you got Mary, right? Um, Mary's a young teenager, 13, 14, 15 years old. We don't really know for sure. And she's met by an angel that tells her that she's going to be uh, with child and that um, she's going to be the mother of the Son of God. She's going to bring the Messiah into the world. Okay, and so I don't know what exactly her process was. We, she had to work through that and accept that. And, you know, she even, you know, had to go home tell her mom. I, I don't know what her first, you know, did she just run home immediately? Like, mom, mom, did she, you know, pull her cell phone out and text her friends? Hey, won't believe what happened to me today. I mean, I don't know, right? Did she think about it for two or three weeks and, and then let some people know? I, I don't really know exactly. I, I know there's enough stuff that was going on in her life that she needed to go see her Aunt Sarah and, uh, or Aunt Elizabeth and Uncle Zachariah about it. I think that was just for confirmation that I'm not crazy, am I? Because they were, had been barren and they were having a child too. Well, and then she has to tell, she has to tell her fiance, Joseph, right? And so, hey, Joseph, guess what's going on? And then Joseph has to process all that, right? Um, your fiance, who is a virgin, tells you she's pregnant. Oh, and by the way, it's God's child. It's like, uh... Okay, crazy town calling, right? That, that sounds nuts to think about. And Joseph had to work through all of that. And then you got, like I say, both sets of parents. So Mary tells her parents, I don't know, I picture her telling her mom first, I don't know. There's a conversation about that, and then it starts going out to aunts and uncles and cousins, and you know, we you know how family drama can happen sometimes, and you know, there's just Mary trying to get attention again. I mean, who knows what was said, right? And then Joseph has to tell Dad, uh, we need to talk. You know, and he's like, well, Joseph, you need money again? What's up? And, well, no. You know, Mary's pregnant. You know, that, just think through the awkwardness. Uh, dad, not mine, Dad. Oh, okay, now think what Dad's doing, right? But oh, it's God's son. Like, what? Think about all the people in their lives that had to work through all kinds of details. Mm, seems chaotic to me. And then you got this trip to Bethlehem. How many of you ever traveled with a pregnant woman? 
Bet not on a donkey. <laughs> by, by the way, that's another one of the examples of things that a lot of us assume. But the Bible doesn't say she traveled on a donkey. We don't really know how she got there. But she had to travel. And then you got the shepherds. Mind their own business. Watching their flocks by night. And angels show up and begin to sing to them. I'm sure there was some dirty underwear there too. Like what in the world is happening to us? And they hear this great story, but they still have to manage their sheep. I mean, they rather than their sheep, they can't just walk away. They, they're working for someone else. It's someone else's sheep. And then you got King Herod. I mean, think about that for a second. I mean, it's like King Herod comes in later. He's not a part of the original knight. And when you hear things talk about the Magi or the wise men or the three kings, we don't know they were kings either. The Bible didn't say that. But they came much later. Jesus was probably a toddler when they came around. And that's why what King Herod thought was this, this star that they saw, this baby that was born, probably happened somewhere in the last two years. And here's what he did. He says, we're going to kill all the babies, the male babies, two years old and younger. We're going to kill them all. I mean, can you imagine the chaos and the drama and the pain that was taking place in that region at that time? That's not a silent night. That's painful is what that is. Yet in the middle of an avalanche of disastrous circumstances, in, in the middle of the, these, these, everything from painful to just inconvenient, these odd personalities... God always had a plan. <coughs> the same, <coughs> the same is true for us today. That whatever you're going through, wherever you are, whatever's happening in your world, whatever level of chaos or uncertainty or anxiety or depression, loneliness, sadness, pain, whatever you're walking through today, God always has a plan. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world, and everyone went to his own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born. And she gave birth to her firstborn, a son, she wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloth, lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to men on whom his favor rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing which has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. And when they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds 
had said to them. But Mary treasured all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. Jesus, born in a, a filthy place. He, sent, he spent his, his first night most likely surrounded by cattle and sheep, hay bales, and, and barnyard smells. Yet in that moment, hours old, he was the Christ, the son of the living God. He was the Messiah, the savior of the world. He was God's plan to redeem mankind. And the same thing is true today that in the barnyard smells of our lives, he's still Jesus. He's still the giver of hope and the giver of peace. He's still our forgiver, and he's the one who reconciles us back to God. He's the one who restores us. He's the one who makes us whole. He's exactly who God called him to be. You know, uh, it's so easy to get kind of caught up in the Christmas story. But the typical Christmas story, it, it, it misses the point. It, it takes this baby and he's, uh, he's so sweet and he's so innocent. He's helpless. But that baby, he grew up to become a perfect man, to live a perfect life, to be hung on a cross to become the sin of all mankind, to become my sin and, and your sin. He, he's a warrior king. He's not just this little bitty warm fuzzy baby. He grew up to become the king of kings. He's, he grew up to be the man that said, if you want to come follow me, deny yourself and take up your cross daily. That was Jesus. We live in a world that is over-commercialized Christmas. There's, they've even tried to write the main character out of the story. But at the end of the day, there is no Christmas without Jesus. People are struggling with hope People are struggling with uncertainty. People are walking in some level of darkness. And here we come to this time called Christmas. The word actually means the festival of Christ. It's the celebration of Christ. If a group of atheists got together and had a Christmas party, what are they doing? The name says they're celebrating Christ at some level. Just process it for a second. There is no Christmas without Christ. Every tree that we decorate is really symbolic of the tree that was cut down, turned into a cross, and was decorated with the broken body of our Savior. Every gift that we give is really just symbolic of God's perfect gift to us when he gave his one and only son to be the Savior of the world. Every party we throw it's just symbolic of the party that is thrown in heaven when one sinner repents. But in a world full of darkness, in a world full of chaos and uncertainty and lost hope, anxiety and depression, there's good news. The gospel. The best news ever about a God who so loved the world that he sent Jesus to be his one and only his savior of the world, to be the light of the world. Just in the middle of darkness, there's a light. In the middle of whatever, walking in, whatever you're walking through in your world, there's a light. The Spirit of God is able to stir that in us. Now, there are all kinds of examples. Times where the Holy Spirit stirred hope in people. 
We're God's son, the light of the world. Was used by him to be light in the darkness of a person's life. Like, like one example, 1861, it's Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. His wife had just died tragically in a fire. He's broken. The Civil War starts. His son goes off to fight for the Northern Army as a lieutenant. He's gravely wounded, almost dies. And on Christmas Day, 19, or 1863, he sat at his desk, processing his grief, and he wrote these words. I heard the bells on Christmas Day, their old familiar carols play, and mild and sweet their songs repeat of peace on earth, goodwill to men. And the bells are ringing, like a choir they're singing. In my heart I hear them, peace on earth, goodwill to men. And in despair I bowed my head, there is no peace on earth, I said, for hate is strong and mocks the song of peace on earth, goodwill to men. But the bells are ringing, the choir singing. Does anybody hear them? Peace on earth, goodwill to men. Then rang the bells more loud and deep. God is not dead, nor does he sleep. The wrong shall fail, the right prevail. Peace on earth, goodwill to men. Do you hear the bells? They're ringing. The life, the angels singing. Open your hearts and hear them. Peace on earth, goodwill to men. Just the sound of Christmas bells or church bells stirred hope in his heart. I mean, God can use the most routine of things. He'd heard those church bells on Christmas Day or on Sunday morning, probably every day for decades. But on that day, they stirred hope in him. I, I was so moved by the lines that he wrote when he, when he said, and in despair I bowed my head. There is no peace on earth, I said. For hate is strong that mocks the song of peace on earth, goodwill to men. Have you ever felt that way? I mean, if you're honest, do you feel that way today? The hate is so strong. It, it mocks the song of Jesus. It mocks the song of the gospel. It mocks the song of peace. But those bells, just like on the day that he heard them, they're still ringing. They're not the ones you hear with your ears, but the ones you hear in your heart. They're still ringing. If you open your heart, you might be able to hear them. The darker the circumstance, the darker the storm you're walking through, the darker the chaos of your life, the brighter the light of Jesus shines. The louder, the deeper those bells are going to ring and they're going to say in his words, God is not dead, nor does he sleep. The wrong shall fail, the right prevail with peace on earth, goodwill to men. Wow. What a moment for him, I'm sure. So we sing songs like that and don't think about the, the moment the man or the woman was in when they wrote the song. What a moment. Perfect circumstances are, are never have been a part of Christmas. It, it wasn't a part of the original Christmas. It wasn't a part of, it, of Henry Longfellow's Christmas. It's just never been. It wasn't a part of Christmas in, 18, in 1914 when the Germans and the British were singing back and forth. But hope has always been a part of Christmas. This Christmas, your circumstances may not be perfect, but you can still find hope you can still find redemption. You can still find a place where God meets you and stirs hope in you. Is your heart open today? Are you listening today? <sighs> the, probably the greatest miracle of Christmas isn't that God sent a baby to lie in a manger, but that God said, I'm going to come and dwell with man. But that's really what it's about, is that God comes down in the midst of our imperfect circumstances 
And instead of saying, I'm going to pull you out of your circumstances, he says, I'm going to come and be in your circumstances with you. When Isaiah was prophesying, what he said was, what, how he said it was, uh, he called him Emmanuel, meaning God with us. That God was coming to live with us. And when Jesus was here and then he got ready to go back in heaven, he said, I'm going to give the Holy Spirit another one just like me. And still God with us. And for us who know Christ our Savior, it's also God in us. That God lives in us. I mean, how Paul wrote it was, Christ in you, it's the hope of glory. I mean, what a moment. Think about that for a second. The one who raised Christ from the dead, the, the one who impregnated Mary and raised Christ from the dead, lives in you. That the word became flesh. He dwelt among us. And for those of us who believe in him as our savior, he lives in us. God's always had a plan in the middle of crazy circumstances. In the middle of broken moments and broken lives. In the middle of the stuff that you and I are walking through. And God is with us. God is here this Christmas to give you hope. To give you forgiveness. You can find peace. You can find eternal life. This Christmas, you can find a path through the chaos. So many times we can go to church. I said every Sunday, still live in darkness. Maybe this is the Christmas that you hear the bells ringing. Maybe this is the Christmas that light shines in your darkness. Maybe this is the Christmas that the meaning of Christmas goes from a baby in a manger to a savior in your heart. Every year, year in, and you're out, we come to a season just like this. We come to a place and we look around and one year's ending, one year's beginning. We're evaluating where we've been. We're looking forward to what's ahead. And yet in the middle of all of that, there's this thing. There's this thing that's like, am I really okay? Am I where I need to be today? See, many times we're not. So what happens is, is that, that God sent Jesus as a baby, but it's not so much about the baby. It's about who the baby became. The man who lived the perfect life, hung on a cross, and died for the sin of mankind, who became my sin. Seven hundred years before before Jesus' birth, it was Isaiah talking about God with us, Emmanuel. Five hundred years before Christmas, it was before the birth of Jesus. It was Micah talking about him being born in Bethlehem. Four hundred years before Christmas, there was this moment where this window of time where it just seemed like that God wasn't really speaking through the prophets anymore. But yet he was still at work in world powers and he's raised up Persia and, and Persia is sending people back to Israel to rebuild the temple and rebuild the walls. And then he raises up Greek, uh, Greece under uh, Alexander the Great and he raises them up and they, they come and they give us a common language. And then he raises up Rome and Rome gives us this amazing network of roads. They, they built roads so that, that their armies could travel, right? They had no idea that the reason that God wanted the roads built was for the gospel to travel across the known world. And how the Bible says it is, is that when, when, when a time had reached fulfillment, what that really means is when all the things were in place, when the common language was there, when the temple was rebuilt, when the walls were rebuilt, when we got to the place where we had road systems, it says that God sent a son. And every year, 
we gather around manger scenes, just remember the hope that we find at Christmas. Hope that can only be found in Jesus. This is my hope. That God loved me enough to send his son to down a cross from me. It's really the only hope the world has. It's not in our money. It can't be in our education. It can't be in our politicians. It can't be in our health even. The only hope that works, the only hope that lasts is the hope that we'll find in Christ. That he is my hope. The world, the world needs to hear that. Let's break that down a little more. The communities we live in, they need to hear that. Okay, let's get a little smaller. The, the, the families, our families and our friends, they need to hear that message of hope. They need to hear about a God who loved them, who is no longer holding their sin against them, who's reconciling them back to himself in Christ. They, they, they need to be able to hear that message. For some of us, maybe this is our day of salvation. This is the day that we're finding Christmas what we're really finding is eternal life. Today may be your day to choose to place your faith in Jesus as your Savior, as your forgiver, as the one who gives you hope and gives you peace. Maybe the day is your day. For the rest of us who know him, there are people all around us who need to hear the hope. Let's give it away. Let's give it away. Let's tell everyone we know. Let's live the way we, that we, what we believe. Let's speak about what we believe. Let's write about what we believe. Let's tell people about the hope we have in Jesus. Because they're looking for hope. And that hope can only be found in him. And the greatest thing is, is that as you give hope away, God will renew your hope every single time. Hope has a name. And his name is Jesus. Jesus.